Chapter Two of the Stillwater Tragedy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Stillwater Tragedy by Thomas Bailey Aldridge. Chapter Two. That morning, when Michael Hennessy's girl Mary, a girl sixteen years old, carried the can of milk to the rear door of the silent house, she was nearly a quarter of an hour later than usual and looked forward to being soundly rated. He's up and waiting for it she said to herself observing the scullery door ajar won't i catch it it's him for growlin and snappin at a body and it's me for always bein before or behind time bad luck to me there's no plays in him mary pushed back the door and passed through the kitchen serving herself all the while to meet the objurgations which she supposed were lying in wait for her the sunshine was blinding without but sifted through the green jalousies it made a grey crepuscular light within as the girl approached the table, on which a plate with a knife and fork had been laid for breakfast, she noticed, somewhat indistinctly at first, a thin red line running obliquely across the floor from the direction of the sitting-room, and ending near the stove, where it had formed a small pool. Mary stopped short, scarcely conscious why, and peered instinctively into the adjoining apartment. Then, with a smothered cry, she let fall the milk-can, and a dozen white rivulets, in strange contrast to that one dark red line, which first startled her, went meandering over the kitchen floor. With her eyes riveted upon some object in the next room, the girl retreated backward, slowly and heavily dragging one foot after the other, until she reached the gallery door. Then she turned swiftly and plunged into the street. Twenty minutes later, every man, woman, and child in Stillwater knew that Mr. Shackford had been murdered. Mary Hennessy had to tell her story a hundred times during the morning, for each minute brought to Michael's tenement a fresh listener, hungry for the details at first hand. "'How was it, Molly? Tell a body, dear!' "'Don't be asking me!' cried Molly, pressing her palms to her eyes as if to shut out the sight, but taking all the while a secret creepy satisfaction in living the scene over again. "'It was kinder dark in the other room, and there he was, lying in his nightgown, with his face turned towards me so, looking mighty severe-like, just as if he was a-going to say— it's late with the milk ye are, ye hussy. Away he had a spakin. But he didn't spake, Molly darlin. Never a word. He was stone dead, don't you see? It was that still. You could hear me heart beat, savin' there wasn't a drop of beat in it. I let go the can, sure. Then I backed out, with me eye on him all the while, feared to death that he would up and spake them words. The poor child, for the likes of her to be waking up the murthered man in the morning. There was little or no work done that day in Stillwater outside the mills, and they were not running full-handed. A number of men from the Miantavona Iron Works and Slocum's Yard, Slocum employed some seventy or eighty hands, lounged about the streets in their blouses, or stood in knots in front of the tavern, smoking short clay pipes. Not an urchin put in an appearance at the small red brick building on the turnpike. Mr. Pinkham, the schoolmaster, waited an hour for the recusants, then turned the key in the lock and went home. Dragged-looking women, with dishcloth or dustpan in hand, stood in doorways or leaned from windows, talking in subdued voices with neighbors on the curbstone. In a hundred faraway cities the news of the suburban tragedy had already been read and forgotten, but here the horror stayed. There was a constantly changing crowd gathered in front of the house in Welch's court. An inquest was being held in the room adjoining the kitchen. The court, which ended at the gate of the cottage, was fringed for several yards on each side by rows of squalid, wondering children, who understood it that Coroner Whidden was literally to sit on the dead body. Mr. Whidden, a limp, inoffensive little man, who would not have dared to sit down on a fly, he had passed, pallid and perspiring, to the scene of his perfunctory duties. The result of the investigation was awaited with feverish impatience by the people outside. Mr. Shackford had not been a popular man. He had been a hard, avaricious, passionate man, holding his own way remorselessly. He had been the reverse of popular, but he had long been a prominent character in Stillwater, because of his wealth, his endless lawsuits, and his eccentricity, an illustration of which was his persistence in living entirely alone in the isolated and dreary old house that was henceforth to be inhabited by his shadow. Not his shadow alone, however, for it was now remembered that the premises were already held in fee by another phantasmal tenant. At a period long anterior to this, one Lydia Sloper, a widow, had died an unexplained death under the same roof. The coincidence struck deeply into the imaginative portion of Stillwater. "'The widow Sloper and old Shackford have made a match of it,' remarked a local humorist, in a grimmer vein than customary. 
two ghosts had now set up housekeeping as it were in the stricken mansion and what might not be looked for in the way of spectral progeny it appeared to the crowd in the lane that the jury were unconscionably long in arriving at a decision and when the decision was at length reached it gave but moderate satisfaction after a spendthrift waste of judicial mind the jury had decided that the death of lemuel shackford was caused by a blow on the left temple inflicted with some instrument not discoverable in the hands of some person or persons unknown we knew that before grumbled a voice in the crowd when to relieve public suspense lawyer perkins a long lank man with stringy black hair announced the verdict from the doorstep the theory of suicide had obtained momentary credence early in the morning and one or two still clung to it with the tenacity that characterizes persons who entertain few ideas to accept this theory it was necessary to believe that mr shackford had ingeniously hidden the weapon after striking himself dead with a single blow no it was not suicide so far from intending to take his own life mr shackford it appeared had made rather careful preparations to live that day the breakfast-table had been laid overnight the coals left ready for kindling in the franklin stove and a kettle filled with water to be heated for his tea or coffee stood on the hearth two facts had sharply demonstrated themselves first that mr shackford had been murdered and second that the spur to the crime had been the possession of a sum of money which the deceased was supposed to keep in a strong box in his bedroom the padlock had been wrenched open and the less valuable contents of the chest chiefly papers scattered over the carpet a memorandum among the papers seemed to specify the respective sums in notes and gold that had been deposited in the box a document of some kind had been torn into minute pieces and thrown into the wastebasket on close scrutiny a word or two here and there revealed the fact that the document was of a legal character the fragments were put into an envelope and given in charge of mr shackford's lawyer who placed seals on that and on the drawers of an escritoire which stood in the corner and contained other manuscript the instrument with which the fatal blow had been dealt for the autopsy showed that there had been but one blow was not only not discoverable but the fashion of it defied conjecture the shape of the wound did not indicate the use of any implement known to the jurors several of whom were skilled machinists the wound was an inch and three-quarters in length and very deep at the extremities in the middle it scarcely penetrated to the cranium so peculiar a cut could not have been produced with the claw part of a hammer because the claw is always curved and the incision was straight a flat claw which is used in opening packing cases was suggested a collection of several sizes manufactured was procured but none corresponded with the wound they were either too wide or too narrow moreover the cut was as thin as the blade of a case knife that was never done by any tool in these parts declared stevens the foreman of the finishing shop at slocum's the assassin or assassins had entered by the scullery door the simple fastening of which a hook and staple had been broken there were footprints in the soft clay path leading from the side gate to the stone step but mary hennessy had so confused and obliterated the outlines that now it was impossible accurately to measure them a half-burnt match was found under the sink evidently thrown there by the burglars it was of a kind known as the safety match which can be ignited only by friction on a strip of chemically prepared paper glued to the box as no box of this description was discovered and as all the other matches in the house were of a different make the charred splinter was preserved the most minute examination failed to show more than this the last time mr shackford had been seen alive was at six o'clock the previous evening who had done the deed tramps answered stillwater with one voice though stillwater lay somewhat out of the natural highway and the tramp that bitter blossom of civilization whose seed was blown to us from over the seas was not then so common by the new england roadsides as he became five or six years later but it was intolerable not to have a theory it was that or none for conjecture turned to no one in the village to be sure mr shackford had been in litigation with several of the corporations and had had legal quarrels with more than one of his neighbors but mr shackford had never been victorious in any of these contests and the incentive of revenge was wanting to explain the crime besides it was so clearly robbery though the gathering around the shackford house had reduced itself to half a dozen idlers and the less frequented streets had resumed their normal aspect of dullness there was a strange electric quality in the atmosphere the community was in that state of suppressed agitation and suspicion which no word adequately describes the slightest circumstance would have swayed it to the belief in any man's guilt and indeed 
there were men in stillwater quite capable of disposing a fellow creature for a much smaller reward than mr shackford had held out in spite of the tramp theory a harmless tin peddler who had not passed through the place for weeks was dragged from his glittering cart that afternoon as he drove smilingly into town and would have been roughly handled if mr richard shackford a cousin of the deceased had not interfered as the day wore on the excitement deepened in intensity though the expression of it became nearly reticent it was noticed that the lamps throughout the village were lighted an hour earlier than usual a sense of insecurity settled upon stillwater with the falling twilight that nameless apprehension which is possibly more trying to the nerves than tangible danger when a man is smitten inexplicably as if by a bodiless hand stretched out of a cloud when the red slayer vanishes like a mist and leaves no faintest trace of his identity the mystery shrouding the deed presently becomes more appalling than the deed itself there is something paralyzing in the thought of an invisible hand somewhere ready to strike at your life or at some life dearer than your own whose hand and where is it perhaps it passes you your coffee at breakfast perhaps you have hired it to shovel the snow off your sidewalk perhaps it has brushed against you in the crowd or maybe you have dropped a coin into the fearful palm at a street corner ah the terrible unseen hand that stabs your imagination this immortal part of you which is a hundred times more sensitive than your poor perishable body in the midst of situations the most solemn and tragic there often falls a light purely farcical in its incongruity such a gleam was unconsciously projected upon the present crisis by mr bodge better known in the village as father bodge mr bodge was stone deaf naturally stupid and had been nearly moribund for thirty years with asthma just before nightfall he had crawled in his bewildered wheezy fashion down to the tavern where he found a sombre crowd in the barroom mr bodge ordered his mug of beer and sat sipping it glancing meditatively from time to time over the pewter rim at the mute assembly suddenly he broke out s'pose you've heard that old shackford's been murdered so the sun went down on stillwater again the great wall of pines and hemlocks made a gloom against the sky the moon rose from behind the treetops frosting their ragged edges and then sweeping up to the zenith hung serenely above the world as if there were never a crime or a tear or a heartbreak in it all End of chapter two